Okay, so we should be officially starting this event right now as I see the recording button on. I'm very happy to have you everybody here. My name is Vilana. I'm the community manager of We Are Developers and the host of our We Are Developers live series every week, sometimes a couple of them per week, sometimes just one. Um, and today I'm here with David and uh, super excited to have this webinar. He's also one of our uh, most committed uh, community members, being on a couple of our events and always keeping in touch for updates. As we do at every webinar, before we start, I just want to say a couple of house rules that we should be all keeping in mind. Uh, first of all, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat on the right section uh, on your screen. Uh, tell us where you're from, tell us what you like to do, tell us why you're here. Um, just share so we can see uh, where we're coming from. Usually we have people from all over Europe, from South Africa, also to, um, I don't know, Ireland. So it's very nice to see this international community coming up together through, this, through these live streams. Um, another thing I want to encourage you is to ask questions. So right next to your chat, sec uh, chat uh, option, there is a possibility to write questions, which we will activate in a bit. There you can write your questions and they will be answering either throughout the presentation or at the end of the, of the session. So make sure you give him constant feedback in the chat through comments and through questions. Um, and yeah, last but not least, please be inclusive. Please uh, be kind to one another here uh, in the, in, at the event in, in the chat se section. This event complies with our um, code of conduct as, that we use also for our physical events. So in case there are some uh, comments that disturb you, please let me know. You can write directly privately to me or uh, you can also write it directly in the chat and uh, we will take action. And with this being said, actually, I think there's nothing left but to introduce David, who has been into cryptocurrencies uh, since 2012, as far as I know. And he actually has a degree in digital uh, currencies. And uh, since 2016, he has been actively in the, current, in the cryptocurrencies field, teaching at the university, speaking at conferences, and consulting, doing consulting for companies. Um, so today, is actually, he's here to give us his vision on how the industry is developing, in, especially in these times. So yeah, with this being said, I'm going to right now turn on the comment section switch David's presentation on, and you can start enjoying this webinar. So here is the Q&A mode. David, here is your presentation, and I'll be muting myself, and uh, the stage is yours. OK, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. And I hope you are all safe and sound. And today, we're going to talk about uh, coronavirus and its impact on cryptocurrencies. But apart from that, I also want to just summarize uh, some of the latest trends and developments in the cryptocurrency space because there has been really, really a lot of, lot of things going on in the past weeks. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it, it's going to be really interesting for all of you. So you can see lots of people are joining in from many countries. It's really gr great to see. So feel free to ask questions uh, as we speak. Uh, I write it here in the chat. I will try to react on that uh, promptly, if possible. OK, cool. Uh, so first of all, we need to start uh, with some of the graphs and charts and curves that you probably have seen, all of you, recently. But, uh, so as you pro but this actually provides the basis for the development, not only in the cryptocurrency space, but probably the whole global economy. Um, so as you have probably heard, uh, there was a huge economic downturn in the past few weeks. We, we, st we, we could see like a huge crash in the stock markets and SAP 500 index, which you can see on the graph that uh, was, uh, is now slowly returning back to, uh, to around $3,000. Um, but uh, there are many uh, suggestions that we'll probably see some further uh, drops in the whole stock market. And here is another really important graph that was probably going uh, around the globe uh, in the past few weeks. 
Uh, and that uh, says a lot about the jobless claims uh, that people are filing uh, in the US, and not only in the US, but in many other countries, but this particular graph is about the US. And uh, you can see that uh, the situation that we have experienced in the past few weeks is really unprecedented. And um, actually the numbers, this, is, this graph is already a couple of weeks old, so the current numbers are actually much higher than this. And um, we'll talk about it later. Okay, this is, this is a graph from the last week, and it's a very important one. It's uh, probably the first time in the history that we could see actually the negative uh, price for oil, which, is, uh, which uh, tell us some really interesting things uh, about the situation on the market, right? And, uh, and probably like the whole economic repercussions of all these things, uh, it will be really hard uh, to comprehend for us in the next, uh, we'll probably not be able to do that until like uh, next year or something like that. And um, the situation is quite critical and not only in the energy markets, but uh, actually similar things are happening also in some uh, um, other markets. Like uh, you could see it in the dairy, dairy farmers across the United States. The, the, the price of dairies didn't, uh, when, didn't go negative but what, you, what we could see is that the farmers were dumping the excess of milk um, rather than to you know, paying cons consumers to take it, uh, take it away. Well, so this is probably a shock like for many, not only investors, but also many other people around the world. And that when we can see like the price of commodities going uh, down uh, into negative numbers. And, uh, and it's kind of, suggest that uh, more and more people will start to be interested into digital commodities such as Bitcoin on, and some other cryptocurrencies because actually this is how they are also classified uh, or kind of they are kind of classified as a financial commodities at least by the Community Future Trading Commission in the United States and um, and uh, one of the developments that is uh, likely in my opinion to happen in the not in the short term but in probably uh, in the next few months uh, that these negative prices of commodities or like when it comes to oil for example uh, could actually kick the door for something that we have been waiting in the cryptocurrency market for really long and that's a bitcoin etf exchange traded fund there have been a couple of proposals in the past uh, few years and they were all rejected uh, because they were proclaimed to be too risky and manipulable. And um, that's what, that was the main reasons why uh, regulators decided to uh, reject them. But exactly events like this that we could uh, see in the past few weeks could actually open the door for, for the development of uh, Bitcoin ETF and possibly other financial derivatives and products uh, on, on top of cryptocurrencies, possibly Bitcoin and Ethereum, but further in the future, maybe also some others. And um, you, can, you could probably also read a lot about how all governments all over the world are trying to help the economy with all kinds of stimuluses. And uh, most notably, the Fed, the US Central Bank is printing really lots of loads of money. You could see it in, here on the, on the, on the graph. Uh, this is what uh, has happened so far. And for example, the Wall Street estimates or like uh, weights that uh, the number uh, of money that um, is being printed in the, during the 2020 could actually hit 10 trillions, the balance sheet of the Fed. So these are really, really robust numbers. And um, as you probably know uh, that um, Bitcoin, uh, and some other cryptocurrencies, but mainly Bitcoin, are known actually to be kind of a hedge uh, for uh, or against inflation. And uh, we will see how all this money printing will play out in the future. But chances are that the inflation rate will go hi higher, definitely. And, um, and this will be interesting to play out with uh, the Bitcoin halving that is coming in two weeks because uh, I'm not sure if you guys know what Bitcoin halving is, but um, uh, if you have heard of it, uh, then you probably know. If you have not, then just a short explanation. 
that um, Bitcoin blocks contain reward for the miners and uh, the whole algorithm and Bitcoin is set up in a way that this uh, this amount that is uh, rewarded to the winning miner is halved every four years approximately and um, and in two weeks it's the the big date when the mining reward for one Bitcoin block will be halved from uh, 12 and a half Bitcoins per block to 6.25 and um, I included here some uh, some points about the and like there are lots of economics doing lots of uh, kinds of analysis about the you know predictions when it comes to Bitcoin price and I don't want to talk about Bitcoin price as much here because uh, I want to focus on more important things in Bitcoin price but um, some of you may have heard of something some metrics like stock to flow which is a number that shows in uh, how many years at the current production rate of Bitcoins uh, and how many years are required to achieve the current stock uh, uh, so th th there are so some of the points here that you can see and uh, Bitcoin is usually compared to, to something like digital gold uh, if you use this formula and this methodology to, ca to, com to calculate the scarcity of Bitcoin uh, it's very interesting because uh, it it's exactly these halving events that are happening uh, that is happening in two weeks that is actually increasing the scarcity over the long time and meanwhile, now the 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 the, the, the scarcity of Bitcoin uh, based on these calculations doesn't look necessarily so uh, good compared to gold because the scarcity of gold is you have written here is around 62. Um, but um, after the halving in two weeks, it's gonna increase uh, the scarcity of Bitcoin, and uh, uh, in another four years, uh, another another halving. It's going to even sur surpass the scarcity of gold, which is something very interesting. And this is probably one of the reasons why Bitcoin is getting increasingly more traction and reputation as a store of value. So, yeah, let's see if there are some questions about this. There are some ETFs for Bitcoin and Swedish mar market. Yeah, I heard of that. Mm, I'm not sure how accessible they are for the rest of the, or like uh, from the investors from other countries. But yeah, I heard of that. Uh, I mean, it's definitely a cool thing to have. I don't think in, essentially that all these Bitcoin der derivatives are so important for the Bitcoin itself. Because, I mean, of course, it depends what you are you know, going for. Um, if you want to really just you know, earn money with Bitcoins, and, uh, then oh, this is something probably you want because you want to have more market instruments and more ways for uh, investors and especially institutional investors to engage with Bitcoin. But I don't think for the Bitcoin ecosystem or even the, the, the protocol itself, this is really necessary. But it's kind of a, you know, nice to have. Okay, let's move a little bit uh, from, um, yeah, so what happened? Uh, probably unsurprisingly, as the stock prices uh, went down, uh, the Bitcoin uh, price dropped significantly actually from something over 50%, from $9,000 to something around $4,000 uh, for one Bitcoin. And this is a huge drop, of course. Uh, it's not something that we are, like, I mean, probably most of the cryptocurrency investors are used to this kind of volatility. But the truth is that actually this kind of volatility is really rare, even in Bitcoin. And uh, if you look at the historical charts, uh, you can see that actually this March, uh, this year uh, marked the actually the, the highest volatility in the, the last six years, which is um, pretty pretty tough. But still, if you compare Bitcoin and uh, pretty much any other major asset class and uh, and how the price developed in the last year, you can actually see that Bitcoin outperform, outperforms uh, most of these asset classes. So it's still kind of not so bad. Because, I mean, if you think of it uh, around this time last year, or maybe like February last year, Bitcoin was something around three, 4,000. And so we are still pretty much much higher than uh, compared to last year. Okay, yeah, this, this, here you can see the, on the chart how Bitcoin compares in the last year uh, with, the, with the other asset classes. So this is something that a lot of people often neglect that when you talk about Bitcoin prices, it's always good to kind of zoom out a little bit and uh, then you can get actually 
much broader picture. Cool, but so let's uh, move a little bit away from the Bitcoin price and talk about a little bit about what happened when the price dropped. So again, uh, unsurprisingly, with such a significant price drop, uh, it was kind of expecting, we were kind of expecting that uh, the Bitcoin hash rate will drop as well. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what is hash rate. This is actually the sum of the all computational power that uh, powers the Bitcoin network. And you can see on this, uh, and this was actually the biggest uh, hash rate drop ever in the Bitcoin history. So this was again, uh, pretty, pretty tough, but uh, it's, it's good to mention that uh, shortly before this crash, we actually experienced the, the highest hash rate uh, level in the history. So we were on the, uh, the, the ever maximum. So even with this significant drop, we are, we are st still quite good compared to basically any other previous period in the, in the history. But um, there was a, kind of a threat of a, kind of a, a spiral that, to, that actually happened to some extent because um, we could see that, um, that uh, since the hash rate dropped, of course, uh, the profitability of the mining uh, decreased as well. And this resulted to some of the miners to actually leave the, the Bitcoin mining market. And, um, and because of the, such a sudden drop in the hash rate, we could actually see the Bitcoin blocks started to be mined a little bit slower, uh, up to 25%. So instead of the targeted uh, time of 10 minutes per one block, you could actually see some of the blocks that in average it took 12 minutes. And in result of this, also fewer blocks were mined. And this, has, of course, also uh, impacted the revenues of the miners which is, uh, of course, uh, something that we don't want to see that much in the crypto because uh, miners uh, are actually, and their hash rate and the, all this electricity that they burn into and they use for Bitcoin network is something, this is exactly what actually guarantees the immutability of the whole network and the security. Um, I have one more point here, which is not really, really related that much to this uh, hash rate drop, but, um, but it's something that also happened uh, that uh, many of the miners uh, from around the world were uh, saying that they they experienced uh, delays in shipping of the mining hardware, and this was uh, mostly due to the lockdown in China. Okay, so here you can see how the miners' revenue dropped, which is also probably uh, not pleasant for them, but I guess in these times, Almost everyone's revenues uh, were um, experienced some drop, so it's not so bad. In the end, uh, here you can see how, how actually the Bitcoin hash rate rebound, uh, bounced back in the few weeks. Uh, this, is, this graph showed the time period from early February till pretty much today. So even though we are, of course, not uh, by far not on the previous levels that we had in uh, early January or this, uh, where was the maximum, but uh, we are still like pretty much okay. We're revolving around this 110 exahashes, which is pretty strong. Uh, here we have a question. What is this uh, stock to flow value going to be post happening? I actually don't remember what was exactly the number. I think it was uh, 54, I think now it's 27. Uh, after the stock to after the halving, it will be 54. So it will be still kind of lower compared to gold. But uh, after the halving in the next four years, it should go about 113, I think. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Cool. There were a couple of other things uh, that happened. Um, of course, again, in the beginning of all of this it was like a huge uh, price drop. This time not uh, of uh, really Bitcoin, but Ethereum. And this resulted into something that uh, kind of got known recently as a kind of MakerDAO collapse. I don't know if you guys know what MakerDAO is. It's one of the most prominent projects on the Ethereum network. It's a so-called uh, decentralized autonomous organization. And uh, why is this important is because um, 
MakerDAO is in charge of DAI, which is um, a stablecoin, D-A-Y, which is a stablecoin that is packed to, uh, to US dollar. So one DAI equals one dollar. And why is this important is that uh, MakerDAO as a decentralized organization governs the, the whole governance uh, thing uh, around DAI and uh, in a decentralized way. So this particular stablecoin is not released by any single entity, but uh, it's actually released and issued by the smart contract to which people put collateral in form of eaters. And um, so they can actually uh, issue this, uh, this die. Uh, we do, we'll, I don't want to get uh, too deep into that, but there are a couple of things that really happened and here you can actually see how, what was the order of the things and the order of the events. Uh, of course, because of the price was going so, so, so much down, uh, the whole, there was of course increase in traffic on the whole network. This actually applied not only to you know, the blockchain itself, but also on the cryptocurrency exchanges. But uh, now uh, it's important that this happened on the Ethereum blockchain and the whole network was overwhelmed and um, you know, the transactions were queuing, so some of them didn't pass through, and the ga gas price went up uh, quite significantly. Gas price is basically, in in this uh, regard, uh, transaction fees or like how much it costs to you know execute uh, uh, and some action on the Ethereum network. Uh, this actually resulted into something uh, that we call like a failure of oracles, which are these um, connectors bridges from the, the, the devices or like let's say entities that bridge the Ethereum blockchain and feed them with data from the outside world. And we here we are talking about price oracles and because of the high gas prices, um, some of the oracles failed to update their feeds. And uh, this again caused and went on with a further chain reaction where um, I don't want to explain the CDP liquidations, but the, so the people who actually were putting their collateral in the form of ether into the smart contracts, they lost their money because of this point, what you can see here, because the, this collateral was essentially auctioned uh, basically for free. Some people get really lucky and um, and earn quite uh, some money on this. And the people who were, you know, these most active members of the MakerDAO community uh, and who were actually, you know, having the skin in the game, uh, putting their eaters into collateral and minting the DAI stablecoin. So they actually lost uh, their collateral, which is a really, really not nice thing. And uh, this actually caused uh, probably something we have not seen so far yet. Uh, that um, this caused or started a class uh, action lawsuit against the MakerDAO Foundation. So we will, uh, this will be really interesting to follow for the future, how it's going to develop, because I think it's kind of the first time that we will have a you know, class action against... Um, the, okay, I mean, essentially, it's... Uh, Mm, decentralized autonomous organization and it's of course not uh, really clear how it's gonna you know play um, uh, w w w like interact with the legal system that we have so i recommend everyone to follow this because uh, there will probably really some interesting developments there cool um and MakerDAO is uh one of them, as I mentioned, one of the most prominent projects within the Ethereum ecosystem. And um, within Ethereum, we have also a subset of projects where also MakerDAO belongs. And we call them DeFi or decentralized finance. So essentially, these are open source um, decentralized apps that are running on top of Ethereum. And they're, in a way, are trying to imitate the role of the legacy financial institutions, as we know them, like banks, uh, liquidity providers, uh, borrowers, uh, exchanges, and so on. But they transform all of this functionality into the form of a decentralized applications. And um, just very shortly before this collapse, uh, we actually could see that um, the total value 
of uh, of uh, of the man of the money uh, deposited into the various kinds of protocols within the DeFi ecosystem amounted to something over one billion. So it was a kind of a huge, huge milestone. And um, then, of course, again, you, as you can see on the graph, we saw a huge drop again. And now we are bouncing back a little bit, and we are at around the eight hundred uh, million dollars, which is still, of course, something. It's insignificant amount if you compare it to basically any other you know, major markets. These are really just drops in the ocean. But um, of course, it's still not all of these applications basically um, are, are still have a long way to go when it comes to user experience. And uh, as we will also talk a little bit in a while, uh, still the security issues are quite uh, uh, quite important here and we could we still could see lots of hacks and bugs in the codes uh which also preceded this event uh if maybe if some of you actually follow the DeFi space that you you probably remember these two very important hacks that happened by end of february where basically really really brilliant beautiful hacks happened where an attacker could uh, within one transaction basically hack the multiple <laughs> different apps or he basically didn't hack them but he kind of exploited the inefficiencies on the market and low liquidity on the whole space and earn hundreds of thousands of dollars okay what is interesting to see in the past few weeks uh, as well is that um, so i mentioned dai that is governed by MakerDAO, and but we have many other uh, stable coins that are kind of this um, old school stable coins because they are issued and governed by centralized entities different kind of companies and um, and the amount of uh, these stable coins being issued and in circulation has grown significantly in the past few weeks as you can see here uh, so the first column is you know for by end of uh, beginning of march and um, the second column talks about the mid april and the third column talks the the delta of these two columns so um, they grow significantly this is something that um, we can mention in the end uh, because uh, some of you have heard that also facebook is um, getting ready to launch their libra stablecoin and uh, that's uh, and recently i think it was just last week they or maybe two weeks ago and uh, they announced kind of a redesign of the whole network and they made basically two or three changes, but those changes are really, really significant. And instead of their initial plan where they wanted to kind of release a new currency that will be packed to multiple different uh, fiat currencies like dollar, pound, or euro, and uh, it will be packed to these currencies and um, basically backed by the basket of them. So they decided eventually to go with um, each fiat currency having in the in their own stable coin so we will have we could we will be able to see dollar separately on libra network euro separately and uh, pound separately as well and um and the second very huge change uh, to this uh, stable coin is that uh initially facebook announced that uh, they will have a um, goal to over the time to transform the the whole network towards something, uh, some permissionless system, because it starts as kind of a permission system where only the members of the consortium can participate in the validation of the transactions within the network. And, uh, and the, the initial version of the white paper was mentioning that the goal is to transfer to permissionless system over the time, but this goal was scrapped and it's not, uh, it's not the plan anymore, which is a little bit sad but probably understandable uh, given the hassle that uh, Libra is experiencing with regulators. Okay, uh, another quite interesting uh, thing and trend and development in the cryptocurrency space um, is that in the last few weeks, uh, in the last two, three weeks, we could see quite significant uh, growth in terms of active Ethereum addresses. As you can see, we moved from, some, from something around 2000 uh, addresses to something uh, over or almost 4, uh, 400,000 addresses, 
which uh, kind of shows that um, there is a really spike in activity when it comes to Ethereum protocol. And uh, this is also quite well demonstrated by this graph that you can see here now, where probably for the first time uh, we kind of reached a parity when it comes to the value transferred on Ethereum versus on, uh, on Bitcoin. And it's important to know that this, um, uh, when we count or how this value was measured, it's not only transactions of Ether itself, but it's uh, also transactions of uh, stable coins that are issued on top of Ethereum. So this probably helps a lot as I'm based on the previous slides that you could see. But uh, still, it's, uh, it kind of really demonstrates how the whole Ethereum ecosystem is uh, growing. And um, this is also not only true for um, Ethereum ecosystem, but also this DeFi ecosystem that I mentioned. And, uh, but what is, go what is going to be really interesting for the next few weeks and months to look for is that um, there is a bunch of different network that have scheduled the launch of the mainnet for the next few months. And here on this uh, graph, you can see actually um, that how much money all of these uh, Ethereum, so-called Ethereum killers and platforms have raised. And uh, of course, most of them raised this money in the past, like in 2018 or 2019, maybe some of them even 2017. Uh, but uh, we, it seems that we have really a lot to look for and uh, uh, very soon. And it'll be interesting to see like which of these will actually evolve into some serious competition to Ethereum when it comes to smart contract platforms. Okay, probably one of the last things that I wanted to talk uh, about today is uh, some other things that actually not done, because all of these things that we mentioned so far, they were kind of results of, uh, of coronavirus and its effect of, on the markets. But there is a bunch of different things that happened uh, in the past one or two weeks that I find, I find quite interesting. I wanted to mention them because uh, I think it's not interesting. And that's um, one of them is the so-called DeForce hack. DeForce is one of the, again, these DeFi applications. Uh, this time the team is from China. And the DeForce hack happened, I think, just last week. And it's interesting because it's actually the biggest hack within the DeFi space. So, we had the bigger, bigger hacks when it comes to Ethereum space. Some of you may remember the infamous uh, the DAO hack in 2016, which is also mentioned here on the slide, um, because that was the time when uh, it was like $50 million um, uh, subtracted from the smart contract of the DAO. And uh, it's uh, one of the similarities between these two hacks is that um, this time a very similar attack vector was used for um, draining uh, up the um, $25 million from the DeForce. So that's interesting. And what's even more interesting is that the, the attacker who performed this attack later on in a few days actually returned all the money back to the, to the people uh, behind DeForce. <laughs> so that's something really incredible, incredible gesture, stealing and returning uh, $25 million. It's not something that we see pretty often. Other important things, um, as I mentioned early, the, the Ethereum exist, uh, ecosystem is uh, on spike. Uh, according to the founders of uh, my Ethereum wallet, which is one of the most frequent and most used interface for uh, that people use for interacting with the Ethereum network. Um, so they say that the, in the last two, three weeks, their transaction volumes tripled. And uh, also that the Ethereum transaction volume uh, finally preceded the, the volume of Bitcoins in the, when measured in, in, United, uh, in US dollars. Also, we could see actually the DeFi ecosystem growth of 800, uh, 800% compared to this time uh, last year, which is pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, some, again, very recent news uh, from one of the DeFi projects called Dharma. 
So they launch a very cool feature that actually may allows the users to send uh, this already mentioned um, uh, stablecoin die to anyone in the world using the Twitter handle, which is uh, again very nice because it significantly lower, uh, lowers the barriers to entry and kind of uh, ease uh, of use when it comes to crypto. Okay. I think this should be kind of one of the last slides. Um, we already mentioned uh, Facebook, uh, Libra, Facelift, the changes that were ma uh, made there. And um, one of the really interesting things is that, uh, I don't know if you guys follow the Lightning Network, which is the second layer network on top of Bitcoin. It's been uh, in operation for almost two years now. And um, what we could see is that um, there is something called wrapped BTC, which is uh, basically Bitcoin on top of Ethereum. Wrapped means that uh, it's, um, it's given the functionality of uh, ordinary ERC-20 token. And um, why I'm mentioning is that uh, this wrapped BTC recently reached the same amount of money, you know, um, inserted into the in the form of bitcoin on ethereum as uh bitcoins in on the lightning network which is again something really interesting and moreover uh, actually i think the launch of the project that i have mentioned here tbtc um, is actually today if i'm not uh, mistaken so tbtc is uh, very similar to wrap btc uh, in a way that it's simply a uh, Ethereum-based token that is packed to the value of Bitcoin. But unlike uh, Red Bitcoin, which is kind of managed and governed by a single kind of a consortium of few companies that you kind of have to trust if you want to use it and that they will maintain the pack, um, the TBTC, it will be launched on so-called Keep Network, which, as I mentioned, is launching today. And... Um, it will provide the same same functionality, but it will basically allow to you know transfer the Bitcoin to Ethereum network in much more decentralized way. So kind of semi trustless, uh, which is always something welcome in the cryptocurrency space, and it's something that we should always strive for, because we know the centralized entities are often more of a security holes, and um, that's why this is quite an important development. They also in a, recently raised the. Uh, couple of million dollars to do this project. So it will be definitely something interesting to follow for the upcoming weeks. So, okay, that was the update from Corona and, um, and the cryptocurrency market and the state of affairs in the cryptocurrency world. I'm not sure if you guys, okay, I think I have one more slide, okay. Uh, the, the last slide that I wanted to talk about is that, uh, again, Probably not so significant the news, but uh, Binance, one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, just last week launched, uh, or like two weeks ago, launched uh, their new financial derivative product, some options, and uh, they marked actually pretty pretty good uh, volumes over the last few weeks. I mean, it, the whole product is in operation for two weeks, so and they already have hundreds of millions of volumes each day. So it's pretty cool. And um, yeah. So guys, if you want to ask questions, feel free to do so. Uh, I'm happy to try to answer uh, whatever I'm able to. Um, there is maybe like one thing that I put here into presentation just because of the, how cool is that? Uh, for those of you who are gamers and who uh, have been following the you know the game world, gaming world, so just uh, just this past past weekend there was a huge huge concert happening in Fortnite where we we could see uh, the concert of Travis Scott and the, which hosted 12 million people simultaneously, which is really really crazy, and uh, this kind of just underlines the whole trend of. You know everything shifting from analog world to the digital one, and uh, you know increasing popularity popularity of these multiverses of or the virtual worlds, and there are actually some bunch of other stuff that I could talk about if you guys are interested, 
Um, there are now lots of lots of different virtual worlds that are you know, building their multiverses and quite some of them actually integrate cryptocurrencies and they for uh, on top of that they also track the ownership of the lands and blockchain so you these all these uh, parcels in the virtual lands uh, in the virtual worlds are tradable and are being traded right now and we can also see from the stats and the numbers that actually the the amounts of trading there is increasing over the last few weeks quite a lot and also the prices of these parcels are increasing so it, i think it's something really interesting to follow for the next months or even years, because this is probably still a long uh, way to go for regular uh, for regular people, or like uh, it, it will be lots of interesting stuff there. Okay, we have some question. Should we buy crypto at this time, sell it, or just hold on what we have in our wallet since before Corona time? Uh, well, I mean, of course you can still try to time the market and play around. It's not something I really recommend. Uh, as it's uh, notoriously known in the crypto community, hodl, keep holding your bitcoins. Uh, I think um, this strategy provides the best, you know, ratio of energy spent and uh, you know benefits uh, exploited <laughs> from Bitcoin. Because uh, of course you can try to you know sell at the right time and then buy again um, when the prices are lower. But it's really hard to estimate and. Uh, especially now in the times like this when we have halving around the corner we have quite a lot of volatility on the market um yeah there's not everyone has balls to do that so it depends on your risk appetite i always recommend to kind of hodl bitcoin and because i think uh, for the future it's something that uh, it's I'm, I'm really helpful about okay uh, I also wonder if a flippening will happen, either Ethereum taking over BTC directly or it, Ethereum based coins or something new. Or will Bitcoin's LinkedIn network effect hold out, do you think, in the longer term? Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think the LinkedIn effect with Bitcoin is really strong. Um, not sure about the flippening. Uh, for those who don't know, this is a term that uh, kind of refers to Ethereum taking over the first place on the cryptocurrency market in terms of market capitalization. Um, I think, you know, Ethereum has a lot more competition. As I mentioned in the, some of the previous slides, there will be a bunch of other platforms, smart contract platforms joining the game. Um, so I think Ethereum will kind of have to compete with others, even though I still believe that Ethereum has also very, very strong network effect. And especially because of the DeFi that I, as I mentioned, uh, it's really hard to compete with Ethereum because, okay, you can, you, some of these um, platforms uh, are copying the Ethereum virtual machine. So basically all the smart contracts on, on the Ethereum network are compatible with their, the networks they are launching soon. But still, it's about the composability. So you can easily maybe deploy these applications there, but you cannot really fake or fork the whole DeFi system. You know, you have like ecosystem consisting of hundreds of different applications, and this creates a huge kind of lock-in effect. Um, and uh, it's also kind of incentivized. And these applications are you know, all there in the form of open source uh, smart contracts, so anybody can interact with them. So you as a developer, you can simply deploy applications that um, are interacting with all of these, which is uh, something really beautiful, also risky to some extent, as we could see in the in some of the hacks that happened in the past few weeks. But uh, it's really strong. So, and I think uh, ultimately, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are very different in terms of their end goal, uh, while Bitcoin is uh, aiming to compete with the sound money and ethereum is kind of a world computer so um, i don't really see i don't really see the flipping happening in the next five to ten years even though i still believe in the growth of both of these platforms do you think the courses will crash again due to ongoing uncertainty of investors and governments courses no like i believe that uh, the stock market is kind of has kind of decoupled from reality if you will 
Um, of course, there's a lot of money printing going on. There's lots of stimuluses going on from in all kinds of forms, trillions and trillions of money. So um, I understand why there is some temporary growth in, in on the stock market. I believe that uh, there is uh, still a very challenging period ahead of us, and this will be reflected by the stock market, in my opinion. And in the aftermath of all this will result in some form of inflation, I believe. And this is something that also why I believe that it's good to keep Bitcoins because, you know, even though it's not a hedge against the global pandemic, I believe it's a hedge as a global inflationary policies imposed by basically pretty much all the countries in the world. So, yeah, I think the markets will crash again. Okay, doesn't make sense to change other coins which do not have much value at the moment to Bitcoin on Ethereum now? Uh, well, that's a good question. Mm. Well, a bunch of altcoins actually marked some growth in the past few days, uh, especially also Ether or Tezos. Um, so it's probably not that bad time to sw swap them for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, even though I mean, this is something I have to deal with uh, on my own as well. Uh, I have lots of altcoins that uh, lost significantly in their value, and um, I'm still kind of waiting for the good time to swap them. But um, I mean, I, I think fun uh, essentially it depends on the you know fundamental value and the proposition of that particular coin. So um, that's why also my investment strategy is usually to kind of keep what I believe has some fundamental value and proposition for the future. So it's really hard to say. It probably kind of depends also on the case by case. Cool, so some other questions. Uh, but Kraken and Binance, yeah, those are cool, really, really nice exchanges. Okay, Lara is asking, could you recommend any other coin with great growth capacity in the next two years aside from Bitcoin and Ethereum. Well, huge disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know anything about uh, you know, markets and uh, finances. Uh, of course, I have some personal opinions, but um, I wouldn't even dare to. I, I, I have been so many times, I have, my predictions like have been really, really sucked so many times. So <laughs> I don't really dare that much to predict anymore. Mm. I do believe that there is a chance that we will still see some altcoin season and some other currencies going uh, up, like something similar maybe to to you know spring and summer of 2017, but probably to a smaller extent. So I'm kind of hopeful in that regard, but um, I I'm, I'm really not sure which which of them. I mean I mean of course I still do keep a bunch of coins that I believe, as I said, that they have fundamental value, and this should be probably reflected in the long term in their price. But uh, as you say, so I, I, I don't want to publicly to you know make and even try to predict any, any concrete names. If you had say ten thousand euros willing to invest now, would you buy stocks or crypto? Well, for me personally, even though I believe there are some good opportunities on the stock market, um, but just because the stock market dropped now. I don't think that necessarily implies that there is now just really the best time to you know to buy stocks because I mean you have to look at the previous uh, months we had the historical maximum uh, you know uh, maximum level of the stock market price so I think it was kind of inflated and I think this was kind of uh, perceived by many investors around the world um, so even though we have the correction I think there is still correction uh, coming and. Uh, this uh, saying means kind of kind of that this probably will affect also in the short term price of cryptocurrencies uh, because still cryptocurrencies are largely perceived kind of as a, a speculative market and it's kind of natural that when the correction comes the, the investors prefer liquidity and are um, withdrawing their speculative capital from the markets like cryptocurrencies um, but still, as I mentioned, and as I mentioned multiple times during the, the resume, during this webinar, I believe that fundamentally, uh, I think the aftermath of Corona will be positive for the whole market, 
and, and not and for the protocols themselves, but also for the market. So I would probably go for crypto. Long story short. Uh, Okay, a question. Do you think upcoming catastrophes like global warming and such will cause more people to get into crypto or will they seek safety in fiat, which can actually buy stuff? Uh, that's, a, again, good question. I think one of the things that we actually didn't mention, I'm sorry for that during the webinar, is that we could see actually in ma many countries that merchants and some, sometimes even countries were now banning uh, cash and um, preferred... Uh, uh, payments by card because of you know it's it's cleaner and it can help uh, to stop spreading the virus and but of course this is something and in and overall now we can see many countries also a lot of um, you know, pr new practices and laws in, being introduced that uh, track people and uh, now when you be connected with you know loss of financial privacy I think this is something that where that can make a lot of people realize the value of privacy in the first place. And, you know, and secondary effect of it is kind of uh, the fundamental proposition of cryptocurrencies that uh, can help to protect your privacy. I'm not saying that they necessarily always do that because as you probably know, the whole privacy thing in the blockchain space is kind of a little bit more complicated, but it's definitely a step to the right direction. So, um, to answer your question, uh, I don't think global warming is that. <laughs> uh, I don't think the particularly the global warming will make people, uh, you know, uh, think about cryptocurrencies. If so, then the opposite probably will be true because lots of people have still this uh, misconception or whatever it is that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are very you no know, resource um, demanding in terms of electricity, which is essentially true. Uh, it is true, but I'm just a little bit concerned that lots of people don't understand the fundamental value of this feature because this feature is exactly what guarantees the security and immutability of the blockchain, of the Bitcoin blockchain and some other blockchains that are using this. This being said, I do believe that there will be some full alternatives uh, like proof of stake. Uh, of course, it's still, I'm, uh, I think there's still, there's a lot of research going on there and I think there's still a long way to go. But we will see this implementation of the uh, proof of stake into Ethereum itself in the few weeks, months, we'll see. So um, maybe this could also change the whole thing that when people will see like, okay, this Ether is not uh, so um, harmful to the, nature, uh, to the nature, maybe we can use it. And on Ether, we have lots of stable coins, so it makes it really, really uh, useful for many people. So yeah. Um, but just to finish the question, like, yeah, I think this catastrophes and their effects in, on economies and the stock markets, uh, but primarily economies as a whole, uh, will, in my opinion, lead uh, more people to, to crypto because mainly because of the inflation that I already mentioned. In my opinion, Ledger, Nano, or Trezor, well, both are good. I'm a huge fan of Trezor. I know the guys. I have been having Trezor for like six years or so. And it's a really nice device. I have both though. Actually, I have them both here, Trezor and Ledger. So both are really cool. I personally fancy more Trezor, but I mean, it depends also what you want to do because some of the applications or coins are, you know, wallet specific. So it depends what you want to do, but mostly Trezor is fine. Uh, since there is um, two more questions. Uh, is it possible to outperform out Binance with much lower cap exchanges like Crypto.com? Um, outperform Binance in what would be my question. Mm, if you think in the trading volume, well, it's really hard to say with, when it comes to cryptocurrencies because there is like lots of, lot of you know, fake data when it comes to cryptocurrency trading. Uh, mm, so I'm kind of skeptical which numbers are really you know, mirroring the, the true and reality. Uh, so I, I would be also skeptical with the crypto.com um, that it could you know, outperform Binance, especially because Binance is a really cool company. Um, I think they're one of the few companies that 
you know, showed the world how it should be done when it comes to, you know, running such a, such a tech startup like Binance is. And they've been just adding multiple features. They just, one week ago, they announced they are launching a new blockchain, um, which is, again, aiming to compete with Ethereum because it will support smart contracts. And again, it will be uh, copying the Ethereum virtual machine. So, yeah, they're doing lots of, lots of stuff. So I think it will be really, really hard to, what's it called, to outperform them and beat them. So since there we there's we have last last question. Uh, what is your opinion about less famous crypto exchanges like CEX.io? Well, as I said, uh, I think it's very tricky with um, the small cap exchanges. I myself have been trading on a bunch of very spooky exchanges in the past, and a couple of times I paid the bill for it because they got hacked or something else happened to them. Uh, you know, they are like, you know, like the instances of hacks and different, all kinds of different fails when it comes to cryptocurrency exchange are like, there's so many. So I wouldn't recommend to get engaged with small cap exchanges. Uh, and the aforementioned one is the probably example of that. Um, it's always better to be, to stick with the bigger players and that have some reputation and um, of course, if you need to trade some exotic altcoins, then you kind of have to because those are usually not being found on some of the mainstream exchanges, but you know, do it at your own risk. Okay, seems like there are no other questions. So I think uh, we will be coming to an end. Uh, so if you guys like the presentation, okay. <laughs> yes, you can finish. I just wanted to, to to tune in again. You can finish and say uh, your your final words. I'm sure they like the presentation because everybody was so engaged, actually, with questions, with uh, with comments. So it's very nice. And thank you, everybody, very much for being so active and for participating as well. Thank you, David, for for the insights and for the very delightful overview of the trend in cryptocurrencies as you can see everybody is already even people who had to run a bit uh, leave a bit earlier they already said thank you so as well from our side we are developers always happy to have you with us uh, on stage even online <laughs>